Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had the pleasure of speaking with Tony Riddle, the natural life stylist. He has a holistic approach to well-being, health, fitness, sleep and so forth. So he's all about trying to get people to relearn and these deep connections we have with nature, ourselves and each other. And he's got this fantastic method for doing that. And he runs a bunch of courses, retreats and, and all these things. So and we spoke about rewilding yourself. You know, what is rewilding? How do you start on that journey? And we talk about how we can live more naturally, try and connect with nature for for our own really well-being and uh, and good mental health. So barefoot running, which I love and I do, and why on earth he's decided to run from Land's End to John O'Groat barefoot. 30 miles a day for 30 days so brilliant conversation and i hope you enjoy it hey it's lewis welcome to the podcast enjoy our conversations anytime anywhere cool great i'm alive we're live tony hey, thank you very alive. much for coming in we made it <laughs> Yeah, we made it this far. We finally made it. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, I'm great, man. Yeah, thanks for inviting me on the show. It's awesome. Pleasure, pleasure. So, what is your story? What is my story? Um, Big question. My story is to where I am now. Um, yeah, how did you end up doing what you do? Uh, well, it's, got, it's come through multiple um, ways, really, but I feel that I'm a natural lifestyle coach now, so I'm known as a natural lifestylist, um, which essentially means I'm looking to the natural world, natural beings of the world, to find ways of living that are more in sync with our human biology. So that's understanding what our biological norms are rather than our social norms. Um, and where I go back to or where I feel it started is probably in my childhood and understanding that um, as a child growing up in a village that was quite grey, a bit like walking up here, you know, I said, yeah, it's yeah. very grey around here, it's not much yeah. green. Yeah. So we had that, but then we were had... And this is in the UK you It's grew in up. the UK, it's yeah. in a village called Langley. Okay. Um, and it was rough. It was like, you know, when people say about the parts of London being rough, it, it was like that. It was like, yeah. you know, people were really surprised about it. I'm, well, not really. It's like that small village kind of mentality was going on there. People were bored, I guess. Yeah, lots yeah. of drugs, lots of crime. And then we had this local area, I think it's called, we called it the gravel pits. And it's where there's an opportunity to explore our physicality of kids, especially as boys. It was like an opportunity to, we had to shimmy across a train bridge to get into nature and then you find city <laughs> trains would go bah, bah, underneath us you know yeah, yeah. you know it's completely nuts to observe now but <laughs> no different to what i guess parkour kids are doing today we would we were doing it and then once we could get there we were accessing nature and we could take our shoes off and just go and climb trees and swim in streams and just do crazy stuff as yeah. kids yeah. um so and and that was complete polarity of course that was kind of punctuated in amongst the great existence of this this village and a school that I went to that was then eventually closed down. It was it was that bad. It was like um, it's now an academy. Right. And so the um, headmaster from the in betweeners, <laughs> you know the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was my actual English teacher. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So he used to sit with his Walkman headphones on, with his feet up on the desk. That gave an idea of what my education was like. <laughs> and so in amongst that, I then had probably a just poor diet I guess my parents weren't very knowledgeable around food so it's whatever we could have in the house which is generally processed of some nature um, they did their best they did what they what they what they knew they could do at the time right and that's changed over time and now they're really fully on board they get it but yeah. at that time they were very young didn't, I don't think they actually knew what they were doing to be honest with you but there we are um, <laughs> none of us do <laughs> hi mum dad yeah but um so, so so that diet included with this concrete existence i was a kid that needed to explore the physicality i needed to be outside so the school environment was the worst one for me uh, you know realms of adhd tapping fidgeting looking out the window hyper focusing on many different things rather than the subject partly yeah. because the subject i probably found boring Whereas if you quiz me on anything that I'm really, really interested in, I have a depth of knowledge and it's because I'm absorbent to it and I really love it and I really enjoy it. So I can just suck information in. Most people say, how do you remember all this stuff? And it's of course because I love it. But in school, uh, you know, the average person only retains, I think it's like 5% of their education anyway. Yeah. So that's might as well say, okay, we're going to basically just give you 15 years worth of something and you're only going to retain five years of it. What a waste of life, <laughs> you know? So yeah. for me, I remembered all the stuff that I found nourishing Again, that was being out in nature. Then I kind of went from there to hanging out with, rather than the kids that want to go to the gravel pits, I then found, you know, it wasn't really cool to do that anymore. It's much cooler to 
go joyriding and smoke weed. Of course. So um, okay. that became the new norm. <laughs> and then weed turned into something else and something else. So we were you know, going to raves, doing ecstasy, taking LSD and stuff like that. It was a very young age, but it was just because it was just it was part of wanting to connect to something I guess and the more I understand it that's I guess what, what it's about it's about connection to something that's bigger and so to escape that I joined the army and so I, this is a wage? Uh, so I joined the army quite young I was like 17 and a half I think when I joined the army I tried to get in the RAF so I went to the careers kind of centre which is in one building to see the RAF and I sat down like no you're too young you have to come back so I just went right next door and just signed up to the army and they were recruiting and there were people outside trying to get you in so it was an immediate thing for me and I kind of gravitated towards it because of again I think the physicality but also I knew that my father wanted desperately I think he really wanted to join the army I know his dad did and so on so it's kind of a thing that not that he encouraged it but there was I guess there was something in the back of my mind oh it made my dad proud if I joined the army you know people pleasing rather than just doing it just for self um, and then in that environment again great it was great while well, I got to explore physicality and got to be out but then we were held in a in a um, it's a holding unit so there's perbright barracks and there's deep 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 cut barracks okay. um, black down barracks and that's where you heard about the there were like murders that had gone on pickets had killed themselves and whatever um, it was in that space it was one of those spaces where you were kind of lost in time in a way because it was a holding unit you're waiting for a posting and I think I must have spent probably six months to a year there. Wow, doing nothing. Doing no- you were pretty much doing nothing. Yeah, you're going on parade. Yeah. And you're you're faffing around basically with a trade that you might have learnt, but at the same time, kids were kind of kids. I'm going to call them kids because we were kids. We were young, but yeah. we were pseudo rites of passage, thinking we were men. You know, not real men. We're just yeah. pseudo rites of passage, being in the army. So we're still hiding under our beds, like when they come around to inspect <laughs> our duvets over the top. You know, because we're, we're not like actually meant to be in our rooms. It's crazy, right? yeah. You know, and then, and then because of that full-on boredom, I I just thought, right, do you know what? We we used to basically just bunk off and we'd go into the town. And so we'd give the garden gate a nod because everyone was at it anyway. They'd yeah. be doing the same thing and off we blasted into the town. <laughs> and I was in my new car and I bought... Do you remember the Ford um, Fiesta? It was like an XR2. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. That really just... Souped up. Souped up, yeah, yeah, of course. K&N air filter chargers and nice alloy wheels. Spent all my money on it. And um, went into the town, a car full of squaddies. <laughs> and then was driving back up the hill to get back because we had to be back knowing we had to be back from the next parade. And if we didn't hit that, they'd know we were what an hour and a half a wall. it's not like the end of the world yeah, yeah, yeah. but it became the end of my world because I, as I was going up the hill a parcel force van took the back end of my car out flipped my car over oh, no. and um, I had to go to hospital and so I went straight from the hospital having had my hands sewn up and I was going through a whole finger just kind of was hanging went through the sunroof of the car as I was sliding up and up on the roof um, we, I nearly hit a woman in a, in a, a woman with a child in a, in a push chair in a pram I think and so it didn't bode well for me, really. It wasn't my fault. It just appeared that we were joyriding, yeah, kind of yeah. playing around. And so it didn't go well for me. Anyway, that's the car when then get back to the barracks post-hospital. And I was thrown in jail immediately. So it really? was suddenly my... For what? For being, a- for for being, being able? Yeah. Wasn't, there was no compassion. It wasn't no. like, oh, <laughs> you've crashed your car. All your money you've spent, you've probably saved up going to this point now through the army. Um, and you're only out for an hour and a half. No, no, no. You know, you, you, you're going to go to jail. So that was fair enough. But the the, f- the problem that came with that is suddenly, the, I guess, the brainwashing that was up until that moment had gone. It was kind of I'd lost the love for something yeah. within it. So it died. I guess the army died. And so as soon as I got the opportunity, I was out. So I did three and a half years in there. Okay. Um, and then, unfortunately, I, I drifted back into what was the same cycle of, behavior led me in there in the first place so in came the drugs and the and the behavior um until a cousin of mine basically said look you know you're in amazing shape because one thing that, yeah, it's been super one thing fit, that saved that. me was i guess it's that physical self again yeah which was building the facade of strength because inside i was just again just a crumbling mess like everyone else right i was just a, yeah i'd go to the gym a lot i'd train a lot and was in great shape so he said 
you know, why don't you look at personal training? And I was like, really? Personal training? Said, yeah, yeah, so you'll get a great number. If you come into London, I, I mean, I could set you up for a gig. It would be amazing for you. Why don't you do it? And I toyed with it. And they said, like, they sent me a, a load of courses that I could be doing, intensive things. You know, you can go and sign up for this, get your level one, level two, level three, and, and then look at this and look at that, and then maybe get an apprent- almost like an apprenticeship somewhere. Let's do it. And so um, I signed up for it. I said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Amazing. So you were mid-20s at the time? Early 20s Early 20s. At this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and so I went straight into, um, I was really fortunate, I found a personal training position in a town called Beaconsfield. Which yeah, is, lovely, lovely. Yeah, you know Beaconsfield? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of the, it's an interesting space because you can still get in on the Marlebone into so town. half an hour, 20 yeah, minutes? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. people would move out that way. And you know, you had that connection to nature again. Amazing property, just beautiful space really. So quite affluent clients I'd find myself suddenly with. And it was like, okay, this is cool. Um, but it was very different. I'd, I'd kind of gravitate towards bodybuilding for the physicality, the strength, to look, the t-shirt muscles. Yeah. Yeah. But suddenly the person that owned this space, Linda Mosley, her name was, she was training like premiership footballers, but in core stability. And I was like, what's well, core stability? And what's foam roller? And what's the Swiss <laughs> ball? And what's this Pilates stuff? And suddenly there was no resistance machines or anything. It was just purely just a studio space. And you had to really understand how to refine your craft as a coach yeah. to be able to navigate the space and the client and coach them in what they wanted which wasn't bodybuilding culture it was suddenly about not even it was aesthetics I guess because it's all driven by that yeah, but yeah. it was really to, to understand how to move better so I guess that was the first seed of of my understanding of movement um, and then from there she kind of just said you're, I mean you're excelling at this and she was really quite ahead of her time so then from there um, my cousin had said, you know, Pilates is this thing, it's grown, I've got this studio space and it's in um, it's in Swiss Cottage and it's in the it's in the O2 centre oh, yeah, right? yeah. So um I've got an idea. Why don't you maybe come in and we train you up and you come in every weekend you do a bit with us and over time you'll understand if that's the stuff you're into and I was like yeah you know this stuff's amazing because I could understand I could get it now what the clients were wanting and I could understand the impact it was having of minimizing pain and understanding efficiency within their movement I guess and um, so within within that education that process I suddenly found that uh, it was one of those things I again I was being absorbent I really it just made sense to me and I yeah. could just keep absorbing this information and become very skilled at it and then within a, within a year, I think I was working full time in there in right. between that phase sorry I found a gig in um, it's a trading company called Mamra Hayden and they were number one Knightsbridge, right opposite the park. Nice. It was a great gig. Nice. So, so were you training them in? Big office, three yeah. directors. Right. And I'm just there for the three directors. So I'm in a gym that's probably about the size of this room. <laughs> nice. And, and I'm just there, just hanging around, just waiting. And it gave me an opportunity again to, you know, study my craft, I guess, yeah, and yeah. really understand it. And Sit they'd occasionally desk, drop yeah. in, don't, don't want to train, man. <laughs> but they really looked after you, you know, they'd take you out to lunch, take you out to dinners, and very good money. And I was like, yeah. this, is, this is incredible, this London life. <laughs> so um, it wasn't too <laughs> long plug before. into the right, uh, the right thing. Yeah, and then, I, then, I, and then suddenly the city meant something different. You know, I didn't really, yeah. you know, it's very different to what it is now, I think, still there's there was still an, an ability to thrive then i think people are in kind of almost in a survival box right now today but um so i found that through that process then i i, I got i understood london a bit more and it gave me a bit of free time to really understand pilates and i grew with it yeah. i remember taking this um video back to my parents like a reformer cadillac series but pilates we were really new you know it's no hardly anyone was teaching at that point it's not where it is today yeah yeah so it was a video of this guy coming in with a leotard and doing like this <laughs> pirouette and then um, a plie at the end of it. They were like, what's it. happened to my son? And my dad's like, you're not bloody teaching that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, actually I am, but not minus the leotard and the plie. So we, what we did, we kind of made Pilates cool. We were, you know, these cool guys who looked really yeah. great. Yeah, it just changed. Most of our clients, it was like, we were just coaching St. John was, St. John's was housewives at the time. That was it, really. It was the bulk of our client base. No men at the time? No, very rare. Oh, Nicky Clark. I had Nicky Clark as one client. And it's just very, just very different. Just yeah. very different. Oh, Jonathan Ross used to come in as well, right? So it's yeah. just just a different environment. A bit of Mel C was in there, and um, cool. Yes, yeah, so we had some cool clients yeah. back in the day. You know, it's quite a cool space. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then one of the clients said, "Look, you're great at this. I think why don't you have a look at getting your own space?" I was like, "Right." He said, "I know just the place. Go and have a look at it." And it was in a health practice near the Heath. Golders Hill Health Centre, so it's right opposite Golders Hill Park. Beautiful space, old building, 
um, a doctor's is his practice and he has dentists in there, osteopath, physio, chiropractor, acupuncturist and um, and myself in the end and physios and so I looked at the space and I was like yeah I reckon I could do this here I just I need a couple of reformers a Cadillac I'm going to coach one to ones and just shared sessions that's it so I go back and I say to my cousin oh this is what I'm going to do and it's like you could just see it wasn't it just wasn't <laughs> what he had in mind so we basically just it blew through whatever we'd created I yeah. guess I looked at him like an older brother and then suddenly it was like you could see the Sybil Loom rivalry coming in oh, right, right. suddenly that relationship blew up oh, so shame. that was that um, and as I was talking earlier I was married to Katie who yes. we were just talking about yeah. so Katie was then my first wife and it was around about the time we had the studio and then we lived just near the suburb we were on the okay. edge of the uh, suburb yeah, yeah, yeah. this is North London North London for those who exactly. don't know North London um, <laughs> So yeah, we um, you know things things are okay. I guess what 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 I feel that happened is we moved a bit closer to kind of her social tribe. I think, and some of that social tribe meant I felt myself slipping into the same behaviours as I had left behind. Right, right. So I've, there was a lot of drugs and drink came in again, unfortunately, and it became quite uh, along with that toxicity became a toxic relationship around it so that kind, yeah, yeah. that kind of fell apart for me so that was that broke up then our flat went in the process and I, you know it was a nightmare and then I decided right I'm done in this area I need to basically we need to I need to do something different yeah yeah and so it just turned out that my my cousin's studio, that when we fell out, that was now up for grabs. Oh, and great. He'd, he'd basically sold the client base to somebody else, and she decided she wanted kids. So suddenly that, as I've decided, right, I'm going to close the door of this, the door's open to another space. Perfect. And it okay. meant that I could have, you know, classes of six with other practitioners, Pilates practitioners, and myself, and grew a business there for a few years. And then... We met a guy called Nicholas Romanoff who developed the pose methods. We all understand all right. what's, barefoot, what's pose the, methods. So we all understand barefoot running now, what well, we've been discussing it, yeah. and shoes like Vivo Barefoot and these companies. that are, There's a specific posture or shape that everyone should be, or Nicholas's model is, there's a specific posture that means that you can harness kind of the external, internal influences of running so that if you have the appropriate posture, it means you get the appropriate action of running. And then you minimise the risk of injury and you increase efficiency. Interesting. And when you look at that model and what the shape is, it coincides with what actually exists in nature, yep. how these people are running, which we are a running species. So if we understand we're sapiens, we're just an urbanite domesticated version of a sapien. They're not aliens, we're the same species. Um, we know that's kind of at the roots of it. Yep. And when we look at Dan Lieberman's work and study that, we can say that the physiology of the sapien today, even the urbanite species, is down to its ability through its evolutionary process of running that that enabled us so even the way that our abs are shaped pelvis neck yeah. rib cage respiratory system it's all driven towards being a running ape let's say yeah yeah um so nicholas's model would align with that and then it enables you to understand kinetics which is the study of forces and kinematics which are the shapes that you make due to the forces and so nicholas's model came in and then suddenly it was like ah okay what i'm teaching in this studio isn't overlapping into the way we should move naturally. What it's doing is it's symptom relief for the fact we're not moving naturally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you understand? Yeah, so yeah, we're filling yeah. up studios of Pilates, we're filling up gyms, we're filling up yoga classes, we're filling up osteopaths practices, physios, podiatrists, simply because we're not moving correctly, which is the pose. Interesting. And so you have yeah, the yeah. pose method of running, but then you can apply the pose method to um, squatting, you can apply it to crawling, you can apply it to climbing, any of these, any of these things, because it's about really understanding how the shapes should be made, why we make those shapes. And if you basically look at children before they've been cultured into sitting, they're very efficient and they don't have injuries and they don't have yeah. posture, they have amazing efficiency. Yeah. And so, through Nicholas's work, I decided well, I had, that was it, the gym had to go, the studio had to go, Pilates studio. Um, and I pulled out my lease early. It was just... Oh, wow, serious. Yeah, it was bad for me. It wasn't yeah. great. It was probably a stupid move at the time, <laughs> yeah. but it was about... It was yeah. almost like, I can't do... I feel like a fraud anyway, because I'm teaching these clients movement. I know I can resolve it in another way. Yeah. So I can't yeah. do it through Pilates, so therefore I can't keep teaching Pilates. I, what I started to do was try and put a bit of pose into Pilates, and then 
the practitioners were in there were just upset you know like you could see them looking at me and I could see this there was there was there's Some mutiny Pilates, in the yeah. Pilates camp <laughs> and so that one that one didn't bow well there, there were three of us Lee my a cousin Matt um, who was a strength conditioning coach kettlebell coach ex-marine and myself decided we'd go into business together because nice. that's what you do with your that's friends no and family that's no joke that's no joke despite everyone saying the last thing you want to do is go to business with your friends and family family, so we decide that's what we're doing and we set up a gym and we called it gloves because we were into a bit of boxing we found a boxing coach called Kenny Weldon he was like the boxing's world equivalent of Nicholas Nicholas's pose running Yeah. yeah and so he had a system of throwing 10 fundamental punches moving in four directions being able to defend 10 fundamental punches before you could get in and spar very different to what's cultured in and, he, and just the vocabulary of 365 golden glove winners um just an amazing coach brilliant brain he would analyze anyone you could say muhammad ali what do you think of muhammad ali well he was good but he wasn't as good as people make out because he could only ever move to his left and you're like wow okay so he was compromised yeah. moving to his right so it meant that when he came up against anyone they could pin they him can- basically stop him moving to his left and then he was awkward going to his going to the right so they could just keep playing around with them if they knew the ring crop yeah right? yeah yeah so that was his model. And we thought, yes, it's great. Let's go and train with him. So we flew off to the States and we trained with this guy and spent two weeks in a camp with him, studied everything we possibly could on his online model. And then we brought it back and we opened up the doors to this space. Great. It's exclusive, beautiful building, back to brick, like a film set. Nice. North really, London again? North London, just in West Hampstead. So on the West Hampstead tube line, um, it was originally the London Scotland Railway building. So the tubes would literally blast past the windows. Oh. And they were the original um, platform doors. So the doors would be like... Awesome. Every time a tube train went past. Sounds awesome. Sounds so awesome. When you're only when in there for an hour, it's like, yeah, <laughs> this is great. You just come in and do a one-to-one or a class. But when you're in there for 12 hours, it's yeah, like, ah, like, oh, oh, no. get me out of here. Um, it went 12 2s delayed again. Damn. Yeah, so we, did, so we basically we, we created an amazing space, an amazing philosophy, but it was too exclusive. No one really knew we were there. And it was great. And then one of the guys was like, look, I've got this amazing deals come through. I'm bailing. So he bailed. And then the other guy was, oh, I'm not happy because he's bailed. And, that, you know... And something within me, which I, I can relate to, my dad had a business when I was younger that he stayed in too long. It destroyed him, I think, and it kind of destroyed us in a way, financially. And I, there was a bit in me that basically had that. It was, you know, it was almost like yeah. an inherited family line of something around business. And I decided, right, I'm staying in it. And I stayed in it too long, really. But in that process um, of staying in there too long, we'd kind of cultured in a natural movement system. So rather than it to be about boxing, was understanding that boxers traditionally were trained in other disciplines like running and climbing, and and so we started to bring that in, and then we then we found natural movement as in a culture of natural movement into that space. Brilliant. So then, like people understand animal flow and stuff like that today. We were teaching locomotive patterns for a period of time. They understood gymnastic strength we were teaching gymnastic rings. We did Olympic yeah, lifting. Yeah. We did, yeah we had a whole lifting protocol, but again applying. Nicholas's principles to it so it enabled us to have very efficient ways of coaching it was just quite unique brilliant, brilliant. Um, it's got really popular because Ido Portal yeah, the Israeli yeah. guy yeah. he does a lot with uh, the MMA, MMA guys and oh Connor right Connor McGregor yeah yeah well it, it was interesting because it was that kind of the time I closed the doors that all blew up so we were like <laughs> <laughs> you know it's one of those decisions that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like oh no what have I done look this stuff's taking off now <laughs> Um, I was ahead of the movement and then I put the brakes on it Um, so I I, yeah I I lost basically that was the point when um, so we I basically took everything on and I found myself doing 16 hour days and within that coaching philosophy of movement I got involved with a company called Wild Fitness and it was a woman called Tara Wood who set that up and she had a a retreat space in Watamu in Kenya transforming wild humans into zoo humans wow brilliant right so apart from the fact that the, a lot of the movement stuff was still like me teaching Pilates in the zoo. She was still teaching zoo exercises, but in nature. But it's still nature. Yeah. So then this guy Erwan Lacour suddenly comes on the scene. He's um, has a system called MoveNap, and he then basically rocked up. He did a, a seminar, I think, with Wild Fitness, and suddenly it was like, ah, oh, there's a there's a real natural movement system here. So he was a parkour guy that then almost took parkour back into nature filmed this incredible shot this incredible film um, with him in Corsica demonstrating 
real f- human physicality, what we can do. Um, so then it was, oh, okay, there's these natural movement patterns. There's like 13 natural movement way that we can move. We can, you know, walk, run, sprint, jump, balance, climb, defend, um, throw, catch, carry. And if you apply nature, Nicholas's model, what I started to do is get Nicholas's model and you could apply it to all of that. So then I developed like this Fundamentals of Human Movement course. And so I was going then with another coach, Ben Meda, who's an amazing movement coach. We would then go off and present this as a model to personal trainers and coaches alike. And they and they it was a ama- it was an amazing system. Awesome. But then I could I was applying like a lot of wild fitnesses philosophy, as in if our phys- physical, social, spiritual needs aren't met, we're a, we're a hu- we're a suffering animal basically. And so I'm presenting this system as if I you know uh, that I know it. You know, I know the whole thing, and I'm in my gym, and I'm standing there in the boxing ring. And the room's full of personal trainers, and I'm like, "Yeah, and this is how we should sleep and eat, and da 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 da." da. And you're like, this is exactly how we should be. These amazing wild beings, and I'm standing there in a disused train building with tubes <laughs> blasting past, artificial light, <laughs> terrible air quality, EMF waves all around me. I've probably just haven't, I've probably just been eating a paleo diet, but on domesticated farmed animals that have got low antibiotics in them. <laughs> My sleep's been terrible because I haven't been I haven't understood it, and I'm preaching to these people. And the train, one of the tube trains, blasts by, and it's like one of those just moments in a movie where it's like, <laughs> and I was like, "Fuck, I'm a fraud," you know. My God, man, I I can't do this, you know. So I, I arrived home to Katerina, and we had um, Lola and Millie at that stage, and I was like, you know, I think I've got to close the gym. She's like, "Really?" I said, "Yeah, I think I'm done. I think that's it." time to close it and so then it was a matter of just salvaging whatever we could and we couldn't salvage much I had to go bankrupt and we lost everything I mean and I was in one of those terrible positions you know that you face you have a young family everything you dreamed of making and you have this whole philosophy and this belief system but it made me really come to terms with understanding that ah okay if you really get into the adversity what can come out of that and I realised then that None of that was happening to me, it was just happening for me. And I could look at my peers around me and think, oh, they're, oh, they're on this amazing path, look at them, they're, everything's working out for them. But it just, I just had to work a bit harder. And through that, gain more experience in that process. And the experience, of course, led me to understand that the more nature I basically uploaded to my physical, social, spiritual needs, the healthier and better I felt. And I needed to feel better because in amongst that, I hit rock bottom, you know, you, you get into depression and you get into breakdown symptoms that, you know, you just, you have to dig really deep. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. so through that, I understood breath work and I understood meditation and then I found... Had you done that before? No, no. Yes. Only breath work, what, in Pilates because, yeah. you know, to tense your pelvic floor and pull your belly button in. Whereas that's just making you more tense, right? Yeah, yeah. And we all need to relax a bit. So it was more about understanding the systems of breathing that would help me nourish my soul, I guess. And then meditation and then positive affirmations. And just suddenly I was like, wow, what's happening to you, man? You're turning into a hippie. <laughs> and I'd gone from just working on the physical self, but only really the aesthetics of the physical self. Yeah. When I started to really dig into it, it was like my whole social culture had to change. My petri dish that I was cultured into had to change, and I found a new a new tribe, and they were more into spiritual work, which meant dabbling in things like plant medicine and doing ceremonies that were just about activation and just seeing the world very differently. And it did enable me to see myself differently, and that again, that all this is just happening for us. And the quicker you can kind of understand, and get to grasp with that. The, the better life can be you know yeah, and yeah. then it just means that it's all one thing there is no positive decision negative decision it's all one thing and the quicker you get to that you really start to live in a bit more divinity rather than oh this why is this happening oh this is great why is this happening this is great and it's you know I think there's a coach called um, John Oakley he's a meditation coach and I think he, he basically calls it the um, the cycle of inevitability I think it is where we go into like dictator mode yes yeah, this is this and I'm this and I'm this and then inevitably we get knocked down you into find, victim yeah well it, in, in my world I mean you find people go into these like positive and negative thinking spirals mm. even so far as you, know, you go on the train someone comes into the office they're like maybe a few minutes late because the train was delayed and they've read something negative in the paper and, yeah. they're, and, they're, and they're so down it affects their day their week their month their year 
It's crazy. So we, we did quite a bit of work with uh, sports psychologists. Yeah. And when you realize you're going into this, you just need to just, you know, use a trigger or pull yourself out. So for me, I've worked a lot on my mood's always good. Yeah. And, and, and the game's the game and, and there's ups and there's downs. and It's all one thing. You just play, yeah, you just go through and... Um, but interesting because you know in the hardest moments is when you learn most about yourself you yeah. know and, yeah. and in and this country Absolutely. it's funny it's a bit embarrassing to fail here but you look to America and it's different I mean a lot of I've got some family in America and, and they're like I was thinking about doing my own business and they're like they're like fuck it what's the worst that can happen exactly and you're like um, just get another job or you know and once you get into the right mindset it's you know yeah I think what comes with that as well because of the, the fear of failure means that we actually hold on too long which is kind of what happened with me, the yeah. gym space. Because really it should be, ah, oh, do you know what, this isn't working. Let's change th- change something or change completely. And I, th- and I think that's the that's part of it. I think it's that, that ego space of it is that, oh, what are people gonna think? I'm a failure, I'm this, I'm that, right? I've got to try and make this work, you know? And in the process, it's showing you and demonstrating in the very early signs that it's not really yeah, working. Yeah. I mean, for most people, it stops them doing anything full stop. Yeah. Most people don't even try. But then I think the path is so strong. So it's almost like the path is strong anyway. As I say, it's, it almost feels like it's one thing. So despite how long you stay in there, whether you come out early, come out long, you know, you, you can continue. You yeah, know, yeah, you can pick yourself and up. It's only in hindsight that it's yeah, too it's long. it's just the ashes, man. Just build yourself up yeah. again, you know. Yeah. We can do that. Yeah. So that's kind of where I went with the, with the studio space. And then it was obvious, as I say, to fix myself was to start living. So the living it came then. Um, not just absorbing the information but and becoming information rich it was about experiencing it and the way that I could do that was ah, okay I, I'm feeling great I'm gonna I'm, let's look at maybe just setting some retreats up and really exploring this and offering something to other beings right so then we found that uh, we did the first retreat I think on the Isle of Wight nice and um, on in like safari style accommodation and so we had biological darkness. You can actually, you know, we had a guy that come there. So, so, so biological darkness is what? Like no street lamps? And yeah, so basically you can return back to what would be firelight, starlight, moonlight. Because we have this perception of, ah, oh, um, hunter-gatherers are sleeping in complete blackout. Well, they're not really, are they? Because they have to have a fire, right? So the fire's always on. The stars are on, really bright where yeah, they are. Yeah. And um, there's the moon cycle, right? So they have, but it's under a certain lux of light. So they've, you know, the measure, lux of light is like the measurement of light. And so you have different spectrums of light, we have blue, green, red spectrums. And so firelight is kind of this amber tone, so it's not exposing us to blue and green spectrums, but signal to the brain that it's daylight, right? And when you get above, say, 60 lux, it's when you get to 60 lux, that's when we start to think, ah, daylight. Just, yeah. And it's a problem because the average light bulb is like 600 to 2000 lux. It's a major issue, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that's obviously that would disrupt sleep. So we had this lawyer on board, Joe. I coach Joe still today. Great guy. Um, never understood nature and was like, oh, yeah, but I'm a city boy and, you know, I love the city and I love Vegas and I love all this stuff. All right, okay. <laughs> Why are you on retreat, Joe? No. So, so anyway, so Joe comes and the next thing he's out, he's running with me. He's on the cliff tops running. I love this. This is great. And, you know, just sea breeze and stuff. And then we'd get back and everyone, we put them into groups of five, I think. It was like five four um, safari tents so 20 people there and um, his thing was I never sleep I, I can never sleep I have such a sleep problem I don't know what it is you know well, okay you're a city. you love the city <laughs> and you love Vegas you love bright nights <laughs> and uh, so it was obvious what we had to do with Joe um, didn't take a sleep scientist to figure that out but um, the next thing you'd find him was just sleeping under trees <laughs> well you know yeah yeah really really did a number on him nature wow. kicked his ass man crazy so, yeah, so, it's a bit obvious you know yeah so, so the thing was you go for a week or whatever and then you run you stay for you... a week so we'd go through physical social spiritual needs firstly you're in a community because there's say 20 like people there um, and you put them into accommodation where they're all staying together and they're all cooking together they had a stove they all had an independent fire they could work with but it would come together We'd have two hours of movement in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, and two hours in the evening, or early evening. Um, amazing food, movement, play, rest, lots of sleep. The rest and sleep is kind of the most important for most people because we live in this H-I-I-T, high-intensity interval training world. 
which most people are just they don't, just don't simply understand how wide they are and only really when you get them into nature and into a, an area like that can they down regulate and then you have them then it's easier to then say right these yeah. are the systems you can use in the city to keep you down regulated otherwise what's the point you go on retreat okay see ya <laughs> go home now <laughs> and then as you're getting that bit close to the house all the high intensity stuff starts coming back up again they're up regulating yeah yeah so it's for me it was always right okay as the retreats progressed it's like right okay i need to be able to give people some systems that they can work with in their home and that's kind of where it went and then i started to move more towards rewilding people yeah rewilding humans which is again going to the natural world and just and natural beings and just seeing ways of living that you know are simply in line or more in sync with um, our human biology, our biological norms. So then it was like, okay, so we have an urbanite species and they have a wild species. I'm not going to call anyone a zoo human, I think it's a massive insult. <laughs> and yet we do have to understand yeah. natural beings because we don't, if it's, that's running out, our time's running out there. Because if you think about it, you know, I think what's the stat since um, in the last 50 years, a so half a lifetime, since 1970s, we've wiped out 60% of all wildlife, right? But we're not talking about human wildlife here. We're talking about wildlife. What about human wildlife? And the problem with me is that once you start wiping that out, we don't have any natural beings to study and look at what the actual biological norms of society are. Yeah, yeah. We have Peter Kahn's model, which is kind of like this environmental generational amnesia. And that simply means that when you're born, this all becomes the new norm. Next generation, that's their new norm. You know? So think of where, what, what's happening here. If that's that sixty percent of um, wildlife, that's for my kids is their new norm. They don't know any different. Yeah, you can yeah. talk about it, but it doesn't mean anything, right? So, you know, I read it. I read that koalas might be on their way out, right? I mean, that's a terrifying thing. I love koalas, yeah. um, <laughs> but do you know what I mean. So, no, my, so my kids might never see a koala when they grow. You know, it's just it's just, and that becomes it's, again, it's just normalized behavior. So if we don't yeah. have the benchmark of natural beings. Um, then we have an issue so that's where rewilding came in for me it was kind of like well we need to look at natural beings to understand how we sleep naturally because we can read you know we can read amazing books so we were talking about Matthew Walker's sleep um, why we sleep why we sleep yeah and um, Sean Stevenson sleep smarter Um, and they're edging towards they're just it's laboratory studies we're talking about laboratory beings but we're not talking about natural beings so we have this we're led to believe we need eight hours sleep. When you need eight hours sleep, otherwise you're going to get sleep debt, sleep deprivation. You're going to suffer from obesity, diabetes, um, inflammation, yeah, all this stuff. Okay, so let's go to nature, right? So then, seagull, one of the great, great. Uh, someone actually, someone went. Okay, let's have a look at nature. Let's have a look at three tribes. So they look at three independent tribes: Namibia, um, Tanzania, and Bolivia. Right? Three independent geographic locations. Right, yeah. And not one of them is asleep for eight hours. They do five point seven to seven point one hours sleep, right? And they in re- one chunk, or no? And they're, they're in amazing shape, right? They don't have definitely don't have obesity. That's not an issue. And you know, there's other lifestyle factors, but there's other sleep lifestyle factors that come in. So, um, so that's that. That's the first part. Um, they then studied. I think they studied them over for one thousand one hundred sixty-five days. They study ninety-four of these members of these tribes, like collective. And so again, that's the first thing that comes out. The other one is that um, it's around there, it's around the temperature. When the temperature goes down, that's when the melatonin comes up, not just lighting. So we have this yeah. study around understanding lighting, but there's melatonin's effect is with comes in with temperature and it comes in with lighting. Then when they then then they thought right, okay, let's study. They study two hundred, I think, for two hundred twenty hours. They studied the Hadza tribe, the Hadza right. tribe. And they studied 33 members of that tribe over 220 hours, right? So over 220 hours, 33 members of the Hadza. How many, how many, how long do you think they're all asleep together? Together? Yeah. As in sleeping at the same time? They're all sleeping at the same time. Every member is asleep at the same time. How how long? Uh, Very low. You've got 220 hours to work with it. Oh man, that must be low, like, I don't know, 20. It's, It's about 18 minutes. 18 minutes yeah so do you understand so it's this whole we're led to believe that you have to be asleep for 8 hours so that would mean they all go to sleep for 8 hours but they don't so they have a fire going and they can't afford for their fires to go out they need a fire so they need a fire going in the morning so they keep a fire always going so they wake wow so they're all they sleep they wake they sleep they wake they sleep they wake and what are the sleep cycles they're called sleep wake cycles aren't they yeah, 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 yeah. no one's 
No one's in dead sleep in the in interesting yeah, non-REM yeah, yeah. state for eight hours, right? It doesn't exist. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's it really important to know. And why is it important to know? My entrepreneur clients, right, jet setting all over. I mean, I've been, I've been privy to some pretty awesome lifestyles, flown around by private jet. And again, it doesn't matter where these people are, on the monetary ladder of success, if their fundamental needs aren't met, they're unhappy. And yeah. again, mental, mental health, physical health, right? Almost like, you know, for me, um, ancestral health is modern day wealth, right? This is where we're going with it, is that I could find that, ah, okay, to sleep, let's not stress these guys out and say, you have to be asleep for eight hours because it's impossible. I, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, right? Some of the some of the nights I can't. I have to get something off. I have to get an article out, or yeah. someone's asking. I'm writing a book, and I'm in a creative flow. I can't be creative right now. I've got to get my eight hours sleep. What I have to do is I have to recreate the environment, and this is where my work comes in now. So I'm I work with urbanites, right, to find ways of living that are more in sync with human biology, right? Yeah. As the natural lifestyleist, right? So. I then say, right, what does sleep look like in nature again? It looks like this. So they don't have the ability to create sunrise at sunset. That's the first thing. Boom. So out goes the lighting. Now, I can't, we can't work in the dark, right? So what do we do? Okay, you can put lighting in now that's circadian lighting that basically sinks so you get biological darkness. It takes out the blue and green spectrum so you're less with amber tones. Boom, that's the first thing. Pollutants inside your building are often two and a half times more potent than they are outside. So it's an important thing to clean the air up, especially if you're spending... 5.7 to 7.1 hours in the same room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, breathing in out the same air. Um, the other thing is the temperature, of course, get the temperature down. And then the fabrics and things that are in there make them natural, you know, try and go back yeah, to yeah. natural fibers and things that think about what is it um, I am inhaling. And then bring green in, bring things that are more natural into the environment. Yeah, yeah. So there's that. So that I, work, I work with that with people to so the sleep habitat yeah. and changing the habits within the habitat. You know, so if you have to work, ah, oh, okay, I might be, I have, to, I have to be on a screen. I'm writing at the moment. Some of it has to be on a screen, so therefore I wear amber glasses. So I wear glasses that then okay. block the blue and green spectrums of light out. Right. Um, and people say to me, oh, and why do you wear glasses? You don't need glasses because I look like I'm wearing. I'm just they're just normal, normal glasses. Yeah. And if I go out in the evening, I wear them because I'm again I'm surrounded by blue light. If I go to, do you only wear them in the evening? Yes. If any. Okay. So basically, what, sorry, within the, within the tribes as well, what they s- discovered in the 1,165 days of the 94 members of the three geographic locations of tribes is that they, um, they, go, to sleep th- they, they go to sleep three hours after sunset. So it's not like ding ding. Oh, the sun's gone out. Everything. This dark. is just. This isn't. This isn't conscious. No, it's just. They it, just it just happens. People start yeah. going to sleep. You know. So, but but it's in a way it's because the whole thing is primed your circadian rhythm so you have yeah. melatonin that starts off starts to peak and then it maxes out it meets reaches its peak at 10 p.m. so by 10 p.m. your main what's lamented as being a sleep hormone is at its peak your cortisol levels are actually at their lowest right so that's what happens at that yeah. time so it's no wonder that three hours after they're all saying good night. Um, <laughs> But also what's happening there, because we, we underestimate the powers of melatonin. Melatonin is not just a sleep hormone. Um, it has anti-cancer properties. They're showing like night shift workers have, I think, 35 to 50% higher rates of prostate and breast cancer. Oh, wow. Whereas blind people have 50% less rates. That's an NHS study. They have 50% less rates of prostate breast cancer. Um, and then they did another study where they show three groups. So you have three groups. One is a simulated night shift group with lights like we have on now yeah this is just when i call it lights this is just normal lighting yeah yeah, yeah. down light they don't give us nice lights here same so they've got one group working in that and they've got another group that are working in a like a uh matthew walker kind of um sleep study they're yeah. in a dark room and then they have a third group that are in the same simulated night shift worker blue light light experience but they're wearing amber glasses and they do their uh, melatonin urine test in the morning and this group that's night shift with lighting has low to zero melatonin. The group which has the dark room has peaked melatonin. And the group that wore the amber glass in has the same levels of melatonin as the darkness group. So I need to get glasses. Yeah. So it's basically wow. just a simple thing that you can be doing. I mean, people call it a yeah. hack, but it's not. It's just basically understanding that's the way it works in nature. They're surrounded by firelight. They have, they have stars and they have moonlight. So just recreate that. That's a really that's a game changer. 
And in terms of um, oh. digestion, it will support that. So people start tucking into food late at night yeah. because melatonin's role, again, is, is a regulatory system for your digestion. So ghrelin, which is a hormone that says, right, I, I, I need to eat, that will peak if there's no melatonin. Oh, and leptin okay. will lower. And leptin is like the satiating one that tells you, right, I've had enough. You won't have to. Leptin goes down. So you deregulate those both systems. And, yeah. and they're the drivers of your digestive system. Interesting. And that's melatonin, right? So people are on their phones, on their iPads, blue light, yeah. feeling hungry, eating yeah, yeah. before they go to sleep and yeah. not having a good sleep. And, and just, just wreaking havoc on a cellular level. So if you look at it, right, there's obesity, there's diabetes there because the melatonin sites in the pancreas as well. So there's a three systems of digestion there. The pancreas and the ghrelin. So there's insulin, ghrelin and leptin, right? There's three. Then you have anti-cancer properties. So they show in melatonin studies what can happen if the if melatonin is low. Um, you need melatonin for the process of apoptosis, which is transforming unhealthy cells into healthy cells. So that's again yeah, yeah. that cancer pathway. So that's so it's it's quite a big deal. It's not just it's a massive. sleep. It's not just a sleep hormone. And no, so no. if we and you have to understand in terms of that um, generational amnesia, when did the light bulb come in? What eighteen seventy nine? I think it is right. But it's a norm for us. So we don't see it as any difference. You have got people, uh, even in, you know, clients. I know clients that when we did it, when we had our first daughter, we were breastfeeding in a brightly lit room right yeah you know and wondering why the child doesn't sleep and the mother's not the mother's not going to melatonin coming through the breast milk anyway so it's like you just don't learn any of this stuff no we don't because i remember i mean on the sleep stuff you know as i'm a parent i've got two kids but you're geared up to like they've got to sleep through the night they've got to sleep through the night you know like this eight hours no actually no, when the kids more like 12 hours or whatever it is but and then you rush them out your room really quick because you don't want to like, get your sleep interrupted. And then it's just all, you just all get carried away in this whole thing. But lost, I think. Completely lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just, you're just geared up to, I need to get them out of my room. I need to get my sleep. They need to sleep through the night. Then you get rushed to like drop their naps. You mm. know, all of this stuff. It just, you just, that's how you get taught. Yeah, I I mean, no, but, but again, we're taught stuff that we go to, we have 15 years worth of education, as I said, that studies show that you retain 5% of it. Whereas imagine if you walked into a, an environment, let's call it an environment, let's call it, not call it a school, let's call it an environment that was all about growth promotion, not growth, as in wealth, health growth, you know, that yeah. kind of the opposite model. And that it supported physical, social, spiritual needs, and you had an educa education in it. Right? This is how you, these are the food groups you need to eat, this is the way you need to move, this is the sleep you need to get, at least the physical, fundamental physical needs met. And then because it's meant to be an amazing social experience when you put people together like that anyway. So yeah, social yeah. needs should be met, but yeah. are they really, you know, in a school environment? Yeah. yeah. And then there'd be a, and then it should be a spiritual kind of rite yeah. of passage through that process too, you know. It'd be, it'd be very I think we'd see a very different world today, you know. Probably. You know? How have you found it from from like growing up in a like a small village? So that's how you painted it anyway. Yeah, yeah. To to now plugging into into London where it sounds like you kind of ended up meeting a similar group with the like alcohol, drugs and... Yeah, yeah, well I did that. Found it like I, I did that. I did that until it kind of all imploded and then it was just... Meeting Katerina, my my wife now, um, was an, that was a very different experience for me. So I met her in the process of me having the Pilates studio in the health club. And it, that was a transformative process. Up until that point, I had a massive ego on my shoulders. I was a huge ego. I've got this Pilates studio and you know... Yeah. I was, had these amazing clients and I got taken out everywhere and you know I was living I was living a great life yeah, yeah. <laughs> great um, yeah and so Katarina kind of just she was just very different just very different there was something very different um, a more grounding and much more grounding I always everyone would say was, Don't, doesn't Katarina want to go and do all this amazing spiritual work and I think you're kidding me she, didn't, she was like to do what she's like she's <laughs> yeah. already super connected and innately like connected so um, she did a lot of work when she was younger um studied yoga was really into yoga i mean not just on the map but the whole experience just, of yoga yeah. as in a lifestyle and just she, she was really big on that transformative process for me you know and i think just also understood that you have to experience this so there were moments in there with the business she's like i'm not going to advise you this is your this is your yeah. experience you have to That's experience good. you have to yeah. go through it and you have to experience it which is amazing right so rather than in my ear we could be losing Come everything. Like, yeah. fuck it. You know, if we lose it, we lose it. It's just the way it is, and we're yeah. we're together, and that's amazing. So through that through that process, that was incredible. And then we moved um, to my parents. We actually go and live with my parents. 
I was like, right. my mum and dad. Oh, no. <laughs> um, which we did until we could build ourselves up again. Yeah, we, yeah. Found a, we found a place in Windsor and we lived in Windsor for a bit on a beautiful green, amazing... Um, kind of it was amazing because it was a still it was like going back in time the kids could open up we could have the front door and back doors open nice yeah. I could be asleep and suddenly there's random kids in the bedroom you're like hello <laughs> yeah, we're from the house down the road you're like okay hi <laughs> just sleeping but it was really interesting it was like going back in time yeah. and so we and it had this beautiful willow tree and all the kids would be hanging around on it and just just lovely to hear the kids playing but it just what almost just from a, a social norm front we would we were becoming more and more socially extreme to them right just because of the way we were choosing to live yeah, yeah. so yeah. We, we don't have furniture in our house we ground live so we don't sit i saw that on your instagram so that's, I a, get that's to start with it's about yeah. whoa but if you look at other cultures around the world that would be their social norm it's just that it's not our social norm in the village we're living in yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the food groups and the kids you could see there was an element of them starting to i felt that they felt they were maybe fi- i that they were maybe feeling and alienated and i think it's your the worst yeah it's the yeah. worst thing and, and what do we do do we align ourselves with a way of living that is I, I would see is is compromising our kids just so they didn't feel alienated um, or do we have to move and change things so we did that we moved and changed we moved to Ibiza and we lived in Ibiza for a period of time which meant we lived in the north of the islands so we lived like hippies we were living on a farm loads of land amazing um, and yeah the kids rocked around naked all day so it was very, just a very different experience for everyone all around yeah, it yeah. gave me an opportunity to also I think tap into as I said, just understanding what those needs are. And I was transitioning between Ibiza and London at that stage. So right. I'd have to come into London. Do so you're still doing your Three or training four days, and still coaching, coaching running stuff, retreats. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yet I was having to use all the tools that I knew to deal with the flying, the radiation of the flying, I guess, the separation from family, and then also trying to get a five-day coaching week into three days so everything was ramped up and then right, I'd get right. back to a beef and a beef was like oh so chilled relax and yeah. I felt that the two energies were, were at such polarities but again it was a necessary transition for us to work through as a family because it, we would never have moved into London back to London had it not been for that process right can you can you, can you find that relaxing kind of space in London do you think absolutely which is what I get now my my thing with clients mainly now is I have a movement practice with them of course it's a big I have like chats on the I call it chats on the mat so I coach people through movement but in that process I'm coaching them on multiple layers yeah, yeah. around their sleep and around their rest and things like breath work so I find breath work is probably one of the most en- easy entrances for me to get someone to access meditation because for a lot of people, especially the guys that come in, you know, yeah. oh, meditation. And they're like, okay, we're just going to do some Wim Hof breath work. And I'm like, well, Wim Hof, yeah, I've heard of him, he's the ice man. He's a dude, right? And then you're like, okay, let's do some breath work. And then you get them going through breath work. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this feels amazing. Right, okay, let's just sit there a little bit longer. I'm going to coach you through some, just, I'm just going to coach you through some stuff now. And then they're meditating. Amazing. You know, really? so it's just a nice entry. I just, yeah. it, it removes kind of the stigma of what is this spiritual woo woo kind of behavior for a lot so of people. So they get like the active coaching, exercise, all this stuff, meditation, breathing, like a rounded. Yeah, and then we do it like getting, going through ice baths and stuff like that as well. I have a freezer set up there. I'm just in the process with one of the guys that I coach. He's the developer, and we're doing a co working, kind of conscious co working. I'm not going to say wellness because I just think it's overused now. It's almost, I'm just going to call it, it's like a lifestyle building so that, um, I, I use Tri Yoga as an example. So yep, Tri yep. Yoga in Camden, if you walk yep. through the doors of Tri Yoga, you take your shoes off, you put your shoes down. Immediately, it's like, it's a building of Zen, but it's strange because it's just the, it's like the behind, it's behind the buildings with car park and just an industrial area yet yeah, you feel zen when you walk in the, the minute door. you take your shoes off it's the so game changes i take my shoes off in the office and so i i love i love that what they've done there so yeah. for me it was like okay i want to create a building that rather than call it let's not call it wellness let's just have a wellness building so that you go into it and automatically you feel like those those boxes what i'm talking about those physical social spiritual boxes are being ticked so it's not a building that you would go and dread getting into it's a building that actually you wake up and you go oh, I can't wait to get there I want to go in there and so that's lo- then looking at the air that we breathe the lighting the movement amazing the food the water just uh, try and again ticking multiple boxes yeah. and then 
you know, bringing speakers in that are around social change and things like that. So it brings that community kind of hub with it. And then most of the practices are yin. <clears throat> so I'm not okay. having any um, high intensity there. It's nearly all yin practice. Nice. <coughs> um, and and so it's like a co-working a, space? It's co-working. Um, so co-working, hot desking, then renting desks and yeah. spaces and office rooms. And <coughs> I'm putting a podcast room in. Oh, amazing. Um, we're putting a podcast room, I should say. That was actually James's <laughs> idea, not mine. <laughs> and so then... And so then, and yeah, on top of that, so then I'm having a natural movement area and then a one-to-one -one area and then a large studio space, which will then, again, I can have like sound healing, yin yoga, breath work, meditation. Amazing. Um, so I can rent an office and, exa then, exactly. and then my whole team will be able to benefit from all of these different things that you're going to do that's, there. That's the idea. Amazing. Right? <clears throat> yeah, so then you're supporting your whole team. And if you yeah. think about it, you know, it's huge losses that are involved through... I mean, mental health's a big one now, right? Yeah. And for me, I understand mental health's just... For me, it's... A, it's I shouldn't say simple because it's not simple, but it, it, we we are almost making things too complex for ourselves in not understanding how it works in nature again. So again, if you if you get those needs met, <clears throat> you minimize, you build mental fortitude in that process, you know? Yeah. And you yeah. give people tools, again, to how to understand, to live more in divinity rather than in the dictator mode or the victim mode that was mentioned in John Oakley's work you know it's kind of a yes yeah, it's, it's, it's just understanding how to be I guess be more human and yeah yeah again by uploading nature that's how we can exist in that space and then of course we reach something more beautiful which is we're suddenly the voice and the behavior of change so then going on that the model of that Peter Kahn is the next generations are oh, they're inheriting the positive change rather than what's happening at the moment is we're, we're we seem to be have a bit of bandwidth for negativity around change yeah. right i love that i love yeah. that when are you going to be open <clears throat> well we were hoping to be open <laughs> um already but something came up I think <laughs> always it, does well it's positive time. positive came yeah, yeah, up yeah. um we originally we were going to do ground floor and first floor and then the basement came up which it mainly oh, offered oh, us um an extra i think three thousand square feet perfect so it's a big big space now um and it has a little bit of outdoor space. So in terms of where it is in Great Portland Street, it's amazing. Lovely. So we grow like living gardens and things inside rather than walls, but actually have garden spaces that you go into. It's going to, yeah, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. I space. can't wait to see it. I think probably in the we're open. I, I imagine we're going to open um, towards the end of the year. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And then I'm moving on to barefoot running. Oh yeah, let's do that. Because I know you're running from <clears throat> John Greats to Lands End. I'm doing it the other way. I'm going Lands oh, End. Sorry. To the sorry. I'm doing the, the jog. Wow! 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 Yeah. How did, you get into, uh, how did you get into barefoot running and why on earth are you... Uh... I first connected to it through Nicholas Poe's method, through understanding a specific posture. And that's right, okay, that's the specific posture. And, and we look at people in nature. Nicholas would still use running shoes, but almost like um, the old school Nikes or New Balance. Remember those? Yep. They, were yeah. they weren't minimal, but they were... Because they still had a narrow toe box, but... Minimal in terms of the amount of rubber. They weren't the conventional compromising running shoe of today. And so we soon got to understand that, well, if, if we're looking at the natural posture of running, we've got to look at the natural feet of running. So then we brought like a rewilding feet process into it. It's kind of about the, about around the time we got involved with Vivo Barefoot. Okay. And so um, it, then I, I and then with Vivo Barefoot, I then just started wearing Vivos. It was just an obvious decision for me. And that was more of a lifestyle decision than anything else. Because for me, I always look at nature again, and you understand your nature, they're not running all day, right? But we have to look at what's preserving their posture in the first place, and we know that they're not wearing compromising footwear. So, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And then taking that off, and then going barefoot running. So it's more vivos would allow me, allow me to preserve my feet. So I, go, I have a series of exercises that I coach people with that help widen the feet and, ex and expose the feet again to their amazing ability. So there's like yeah. 26 bones, 33 joints, over 100 muscles, tendons, and ligaments, and up to 200,000 receptors in your feet. That's the equivalent of what you have in your hands. Wow. And we lock them away. And yeah. and so through that through that intelligent process, you can understand that's where I get the information from my environment to make those shapes to begin with. So there's that, and then there's the, they're not, the, the, the tribes aren't sitting cultures, they ground live. And there's a yeah, hundred yeah. different rest positions that you can choose on the ground. Um, Philip Beach's work is studying like this. He has a system he calls it erecticide, which is how you get up from the ground, right? right? Right. And so there's a series of ground living postures, and if you really get it, then you understand that okay, the macro skill is standing, 
The macro skill is walking, the macro skill is running, the macro skill is jumping, balancing, climbing. They're all macro states. What are the micro elements of that for people living in nature? Okay, they have ground living practices that help nourish the posture of standing. What we do is we have a chair that compromises and deconditions our standing posture. Or we have standing desks, but the problem is because our standing posture has been compromised and deconditioned by the sitting culture, I'm we're not standing way. properly. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, it was like that, that's where the barefoot running came in. So then it was a matter of, right, I have this amazing physicality, I have this amazing ability to run, I'm efficient, I'm injury free. Now what? You know? And I've kind of toyed with this thing that I wanted to do Land's Engine on a Groats probably four years ago. Have you I'm, done any ultras before? Or? No, but I've, run, I've done some heavy runs. Running, and yeah. I was in the military as well. So, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I can go out and just... If I, go, if I just go... I'm like Forrest Gump. If I decide to go running, <laughs> I just go out. Yeah. 30 far. miles, 40 miles, whatever it is. It's not really a biggie. Um, other than just, like, I need to get my fluid. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. So, um... Yeah, it kind of got it got to that stage where I think I've hit forty, and then now I've been uh, now in that space until now I've done a lot of work, and in that time I think now it's like oh, do you know I'm ready to do something, and I think being able to run for Lands End Shinola Groats, doing it barefoot, creates a story, right? And the first story is I was born the longest baby on record in Reading Hospital at that time. I'm not sure now. I was nine pounds eleven ounces. I was like four weeks late. Obviously wasn't happy coming out into the world at that stage. And I, my feet were compromised because I'd basically, I'd adapted to the womb and my feet had curled up. So I had a deformity in my feet that was then plaster cast and they molded my feet and then I had to have a pair of boots with a metal bar. I mean, the real life Forrest Gump, right? Wow. And they used to prize my feet open. So I had that going on probably the first year of life, right? So I think hidden away there somewhere was like some emotional trauma driven towards that. Um, probably what's guided me on the path where I am today, right? Yeah. And so there's that. So there's that. That's the story of it. And then I thought, you know, I, I was listening to Greta Thunberg and she, at the EU Parliament, and she said, the bigger the platform, the bigger the responsibility. So it's like, okay, what, what can I do with this stuff? And so let's create a platform for sustainability and environmental experts. So I'm running 30 miles a day for 30 consecutive days. And each day I'm interviewing a sustainability expert. Awesome. And I've got like Vivo coming on board. They're supplying on some of the interviews because it doesn't, it doesn't sometimes it doesn't coincide with where they are in the UK at that moment. Um, they're going to have a their wagon, it's called, and it's basically a eco style wagon. Nice. That opens up to become a stage and a platform for me to interview those people. Um, they're also sponsoring me, which is incredible. Awesome. They're a shoe brand that I'm running barefoot, but again, it's <laughs> it's not about I'd be gonna running in their shoes. It's about living in their shoes, <laughs> well, right? Yeah, so yeah, it yeah. kind of aligns itself with that. That's what I really like. Yeah, yeah. And it's not push ramming anything down anyone's neck. It's just this is a, this is good for the human and it's good for the environment. Yeah. Which is what we were talking about there for we're early. I love it. And I, and I notice also you're going to be doing um, accumulate 30 minutes of deep squats. Yeah, so I already, I, I probably do, I probably do more than that. It was more like, you know, I, it's just, I'd recommend people go out and, like Ido Portal's model. So he has this whole thing, 30, 30, 30 squat challenge. You do 30 minutes of squatting a day for 30 days. It's great. I love it. I developed like a squat tutorial and that's at the very end of it because I think what I've seen most people coming in and just attempting 30 minutes of squats per day is that they don't necessarily have the appropriate foot position, foot behavior. And let's call it foot behavior to begin with because yeah. they've been wearing compromised footwear, which means their foundation is poor, which means the ankle is poor, mobility is poor, knee stability is poor, and the hip mobility is poor, and so <laughs> is the posture. So my whole tutorial is about um, rewilding feet getting the appropriate ankle ranges, knee, hip, and then rewilding posture, and then you go into the squat. Fine, right. But I will be, yeah, I'll be squatting. I, was, I mean, I have like a pre-run squat. So I, to get your like hips, in run flight, so I like in-flight squat, in-run flight, a squat. So I pause every now and then, I'll do a squat, and then I get back off, and then I run again. Right, right. And it's just a reset. So it's like a postural yeah. reset. Yeah. So things are a bit wobbly. It's like, okay, let's do a squat. It will help reset how the ankle, the knee, and the hip behave really important because they're locomotive systems have been running and then it's much easier for me to then hold the posture above what should be the locomotive stage from below um and then i rest in a squat at the end i always get back to reset at the end of each squat. day you'll yeah and you know that's the ultimate thing for then opening up the calf and allowing things to just settle again yeah, yeah. and then i'll be working with breath so i, I nasal breathe when i run yeah. Um, which enables me to be parasympathetic, right? You can yeah. be much more relaxed. Yeah. Um, and then it's aerobic rather than anaerobic. So for those that are listening, um, my nine-year-old daughter, she 
put out there on Instagram the other day was that noses are for breathing and mouths are for eating. Great. Okay, there you go. <laughs> like that. I love that. I love that. Are you going to run on uh, concrete or... Uh, everything. So, everything. Yeah, yeah, so this is this is what comes in because most people go, yeah, we're not designed to run on concrete. Well, actually, I, I teach clients to run on concrete before I teach them to run on anything else. Concrete is a, is a linear flat surface. It's hard. So if I asked you right now to jump up and down this on a hard surface, um, what would give you or the hard surface? Me. You, right? So you have to become what? More compliant, soft, and that's what your tendon actions are for. So your tendons suddenly come into a role of being elastic. That's what they are. They're, they offer elasticity to us in locomotion, especially in running, right? And then if I asked you to jump up and down on a rubberized surface, what would give? You or the rubberized rubber. surface? The rubber, yeah. right? So um, that makes you more stiff, right? So the rubber gives makes yeah. you more stiff. If I jump yeah. up on a stiff surface, I become more rubberized, right? Simple. So if you run in a pair of running shoes that are really rubberized with like two inches of rubber beneath them, which they do, and an air bubble, because we need air, um, <laughs> What it does, it, it basically sacrifices that internal system again. So what happens is the floor becomes hard, the concrete, because it is. The rubber of the shoe becomes compliant, and then you become stiff above. So you've got these two stiff subjects and the rubberized bit between, which makes even more stiffness in the ankle and, and rigidity in the foot, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. which is where all the runner's knee injuries come in, like the, Achille, the um, ITB. Yeah. So I think the American College of Sports Medicine um, have aligned it with 70% of runners are are suffering from injury, right? So for me, that's a, it's an incredible stat because in amongst it all, we're a running species, right? As Dan Liebman's proved, right? We're a running species. Yeah, yeah. And so that would, you could almost suggest that 30% of it, 30% of us would be here today on that stat. I was, I was one of those 70%. There you go, man. Until I threw my shoes away. I haven't. Yeah. That was six years ago, and I haven't been injured running since. Touchwood. Well, I have to say you're one of the lucky ones, right? Because we, my my coaching, my where where it came from was I was we, through Pose Method. We only ever saw people with running shoes, right? And they'd come in, and we teach them how to run with this specific posture. Then Born to Run came out. Yeah. So around about the time Dan Liebman's Nature magazine. Then we had Born to Run with um, Chris McDougall. So we went to his first book launch, right? So a cousin of mine healed his plantar fasciitis. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, so we, we kind of went to that. And then what we were hit with was a whole new plague of injuries because shod heel striking runners took their shoes off and went running without any shoes but hadn't corrected the posture. And so it meant they were still landing on the ground but they were just loading the outside of their foot because the further forward your foot goes without a footwear, the more it supranates. It's like a primate reflex. The foot will actually rotate. So when you wear a rubberized foot, it allows you to land on the heel because it dumbs down the forces and doesn't, you don't get the, tran the sensation of the transient impact through the sensory information of the foot to your brain to tell you it's not good to be landing there. <laughs> yeah. So what you do is you then choose yeah. the outside of your foot. And so the foot then goes from an over-supranated foot into an over-pronated foot. And so all we ever saw were Achilles problems and calf problems. And the most common plague is calf problems with barefoot runners. They go, oh, I, I tried it once, but my calves and my Achilles blew up. So I decided to go back to wearing running shoes. And you're like, yeah, but you didn't try barefoot running. You tried compromised running with no shoes on. True barefoot running would be to take the posture back. So that's where the two things are aligned. Yeah, yeah, two yeah. things come together. You're right. Because I, yeah. At the time when I did it, which is around probably that time, yeah. I guess. Um, there weren't so many people teaching you how to do it properly. Yeah. Really. Fivo had some good stuff on their website. Yeah, Vivo. I yeah, that's soon. Yeah. yeah. I, I was, fit, I was, I like would be a lot of me on there. We I was like probably actually trained by you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that and my cousin Leo, it. I imagine. Um, but yeah, and, and also, yeah, my calves did hurt. It took me a while. I, I just, I just dialed down my running, like the, dis the distance and the time. I just, I just started slowly from I wasn't yeah doing, but you transitioned just, that way I transitioned it took me a while to transition like the best yeah. part of a year well we used to have it differently but yeah. I, I used to run running workshops and we'd be like right okay we're in a weekend you're done and then it was just a matter of just going out and then just working with the new posture and the mileage so you'd basically yeah, pop yeah. someone up on a treadmill you record them and don't record them from the front or back you only really get a true nature of it when you see them from the side because the sheer weight of your human head is like above five kilos right so the further forward the head is through typing and swiping and our poor posture, the further forward the foot has to land. So we get like a the head forward, the hip shooting back and the foot landing forward. It's yeah, like a K yeah. shape. And so 
when you record that, it suddenly gives you this, uh, before you were up there, you were subconsciously incompetent. You see the video, you're now consciously incompetent. Yeah, yeah. And then we give you the drills and the homework to get you to the appropriate posture and the appropriate landing. You're now consciously competent. And then you keep going away with it and then you become subconsciously incompetent, subconsciously competent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the idea is that we show you a video at the end of it and that uploads immediately into that subconscious competency model. Awesome. Yeah, br- I mean, brilliant. I love that. Are yeah. you finding that a lot of people have got into that or is it still a little bit of a... Or in the barefoot community? Yeah. Um, what, are they like running... Into a- barefoot, yeah. It's had its set. I mean, they're calling it the second barefoot revolution, aren't they? Because I, I went down feel to the... It's um, really changed, but I think I want. I again, I, I'm not. It's not for me. It's not about the running. I just think, you know, if, if we take the biggest thing to take away is that look, you have to look at your everyday habits within your habitat. So, what's the habitat of the foot? It's the shoe, ultimately, yeah. because we wear shoes, right? Yeah. Um, unless you're going to run Land's End, John Croats barefoot, <laughs> but. Um, let's say, for instance, you spend what, 24 hours in a day. If you believe the sleep studies in the laboratory, you need eight hours sleep, right? <laughs> so then you have 16 hours left. And if you spend 16 hours in a compromising pair of footwear, you know, all right, let's call it 15 because you might spend an hour in the gym. Yeah. That hour in the gym in your barefoot technology isn't going to cut it. It has to be the lifestyle wear. Yeah. And so that's, I, I, I mean, I'm, that's what I'm liking. That's what I see shifting and changing. Yeah. And with Vivo in particular, like, I'm an ambassador for them and we do a lot of work with the kids wear. And again, I wanted to get involved with the kids wear because that's, they don't need rewilding. They don't need, um, they don't need to come to me for running technique because it's all innately wild and innately connected. And so if I don't mess with it, they should be empowered beings, right? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah definitely. It's, and yeah. so the footwear for kids, I think it's probably that that's where I see it. And again, that's where the that's where the full revolution that's an evolution sorry it's not yeah, a revolution yeah. revolution is almost, it's a wheel that turns and we get back to another starting point and we keep the evolution is okay let's let's get them to a point where they just keep growing you know most kids footwear is bad though i've got my kids into vivos only because i was into it but most people when you go to school they, they prescribe the footwear of course and they yeah. start degrading Really? Yeah, well, I think Gannett, because I, I went to. Did you, have you seen Shoe Spiracy yet? No. no. Might be worth putting in the show notes, but Shoe Spiracy okay. in there, because yeah, it's an amazing yeah. film for them. I think there's Shoe a. Shoe Spiracy. Shoe Spiracy. I think there's like a four minute video there. So Galahad, who's. Galahad and Asher of, of Vivo Barefoot, um, decided to put this documentary together, because it's basically looking at the shoe industry and then again applying this na- natural filter to it. And there's people like Chris yeah. McDougall talking on there. I think they've got Dan Lieberman on there. Awesome. Um, and it's I think what they're showing is the shoe lasts as in the shoe lasts are what they the mould yeah. that you make a shoe round they actually start off wider as a child and then over time they make them more and more narrow you know weird because of aesthetic and yeah. so like even Vivo I think Vivo went went down a path they started off re- I mean they went really wide when I was wearing them originally and people were like what have you what the they didn't look great that's like, the thing yeah. you're like a nutter and I was like well <laughs> It's great, but I can't wear anything else. It's integrity again. It just felt like, well, I know too much to be able to go back yeah. now. Can't go back. And um, so with that, with their footwear, I think they aesthetics again. It started to look like their shoes, not ma- not huge difference, but they certainly were a bit more narrow. I think again, it was design aesthetics. Yeah, because the problem with the Vivos is I, I I wore them quite early and they didn't look great. No, and so I wore them out, and, and my mates were like, "What were you doing?" What are you doing? What are you doing? And I was like, well, you know, I feel great, but you don't look great. <laughs> so, but, and I think they obviously got that feedback because, because uh, over time they have, they do look better. Yeah. Whether it's they've made it narrow, more narrow or. I think it's the, I think it's the look, what they do is they're very clever in the way that the, the upper, they put a line on there which, which appears then okay. that the, it drifts yeah. in, but the, the cup, the sole, so they tell me is the same. Yeah, but they're now releasing wider, so it's almost like because oh, cool. the culture of the community that are in within Vivo, if you've been with them for a period of time, and you do the footwork exercises, the feet will widen. Well, I started off, um, I think, with a forty-three. I'm now going up to, I'm approaching a forty-six in oh, footwear. Wow. I need to work out. The problem in the city, um, I work in the city of London, is that generally, generally, you have to wear smart shoes. Yeah, there's one or two I found that do like barefoot shoes. Well. But yeah. they're narrow. They screw your feet up. But Vivo do they do a Lisbon? I've which I've which I've uh, I've got. I've had a chat because yeah. I've had a chat. I've had a chat with um, 
gallad about it and I'm, I'm fully on board with a lot of my guys are like yeah but Tony you know what they just don't do it for me and I and I get it one of them said it'd be nice even just to have like a brogue design or something on the it doesn't just, just a design quality isn't it rather than just having this yeah, yeah. black wide shoe so I guess that will change you know and a lot of my clients like they're wearing Marcel's now so they're in Marcel's which is like Italian cut oh okay they're almost zero they're all they're some of them are, yeah some of them are zero drop they yeah. got maybe have a little, little tiny little heel on some of them right but they're super wide in the toe box yeah. I mean they're way up there in terms of what you want to pay expensive for them. but well, I think you can find yeah. them on I mean there's multiple sites yeah I'll have yeah, a yeah. look you have to have, have a look around have a proper yeah, yeah. look because yeah, I mean even the city's got a little bit less smart now but still if you're going to a meeting I still you felt wearing... I felt like I was going to the beach when I walked down here earlier. <laughs> yeah, because you know you're in a t-shirt. Exactly. You've got your sandals on. It's still, still. You're, you know, you're the outlier if yeah, you walk around yeah, here. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have some vivos on now, and they're black, so yeah. they look alright. Yeah, yeah. But if I was to go to a meeting at a bank, I probably wouldn't wear them. You know, I, I do have those Lisbons. That, um, I wonder but, what is it? Do you think that's the personal thing, or do you th- do you think it's how it's received? Well, it's interesting because when you when you start in in a game, you want to fit in, yeah, right. Like you need to be like part of the group before you that, can get it's along. That alienation, socially, you want to fit. You need it, to yeah, like, yeah, be- you need to fit in before you get along. Yeah, yeah. But then suddenly, when you're when you're in the game, you don't want to be like everyone else. You want to no. be the outlier, right? You want to exactly. be noticed. You want to be different. So. I do have the confidence to rock up in these to a meeting, but um, it's a balance. Like you live in society, yeah. and you know if you're going to a, uh, into a, an environment where you know they're all wearing a suit and a tie, I'm not going to rock up in shorts yeah, no, and flip flops. It's a bit. It's a bit of a balance. Yeah, it is a balance. Of course, it. That's yeah, what yeah. life is, right? Yeah, but hopefully, Vivo and all these other which is where I'm coming from again. Like, it's you know, yeah. it's it's nice that there's more and more brands getting behind that because again, if you break those hours up let's say eight to ten hours if you're in the city then it's that that needs addressing so we're about having the casual wear right or the gym wear this is the thing it's yeah it's, during the day it's like it has the main to be that, that wear that even some of change. the socks you've got now though they're so tight you know it constricts your feet then you're in these shoes there was someone that produced a document um a piece um i think it was an osteopath and he had he was demonstrating basically the behavior of the human foot through aging and so you start off with this you know, soft, really compliant foot, and then it starts to get re- more and more rigid. I think through puberty, and so if we're wa- wearing socks, even socks have an, have the ability to pull the toes in, so the toes yeah, start yeah. to become more and more narrow. You know. Yeah, I'm going to buy some of the. Um, you get the finger. Um, it, I can't remember what they're called now. Yeah, toe uh, socks. Yeah, like yeah, so tabio. I've, I'm wearing tabio at the moment. They're quite nice, and they've got like a this little bit of grip underneath. Oh, them. okay. Yeah, they're quite nice. There's a few around. Yeah, I'm yeah, they're great, man. Yeah. That keeps the feet in shape as well. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and then you get the experience of what the toes feel like within the shoe, separate. Yeah, 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 That's yeah. Good. Really nice. Awesome. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming in. Are we done? How can people find you? Um, right, you can find me. Um, this is, it always feels like the sale of this part, <laughs> doesn't it? Right, I'm selling it. Just now. The, if you want to look at some um, good. TonyRiddle.com. There's one space. That's my website. Awesome. Um, or at the Natural Lifestylist on Instagram. Perfect. And are you yeah. going to have, um, when you do your run, you're going to have like videos of what you're doing? The- yeah, so we've got people that want to come film it. Um, I just did a doc. A little, I've just done a couple of films with um, We Move. We Move magazines. They shot like a one-minute reel of running, and then a four-minute one of us lifestyle stuff. And I've just done another little documentary of someone else. So I'm gonna have people that will be joining me along the route. Great. Um, I'll be doing Insta lives every day. Yeah. Um, and then putting YouTube stuff out, stuff out with the interviews I'll be covering. So it's worth checking out those. You've got some great people on board. Um, Zach Bush is. I mean, maybe you've heard of Zach Bush. Zach Bush know. is doing amazing work. Um, Rich Rollo, I went over and did a podcast with in LA. He looks like he's going to be in Europe, so if he's, he's joining me, amazing. Yeah, there's some. There's some. So you can have some people running with you that are going to run with me. Yeah, they're like the happy pair are coming over from Ireland, so I've just called them today and said, look, you know, I hope you hope you get your training. So I'm expecting you to do 30 miles with me. And don't bring your trainers. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're actually into it now. They they start. They got. I got them in Vivos. They started wearing Vivos. Right, right. And then Zach Bush went over there. Zach Bush started to talk beyond just the sensory impact of the feet. He started to then discuss microbiome and how we're absorbing microbiome the whole time. That's what we failed to understand. That's why you need to get into nature more because you need a natural microbiome rather than what would be a a city microbiome the whole time. Imagine you just went from one linear box to another linear box. 
you're sensory deprived but you're microbiome deprived so it's about getting out into natural spaces so they're walking around a lot more barefoot now and I think they might do a fair bit of it barefoot wing. Oh, Ron Von Chatterjee as well, Doctor in the House. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did a yeah. podcast with him last Monday. Nice. Like Monday's in my podcast, didn't I? Love it. And um, got him out barefoot running. So he's now oh, wow. already at that point where he said, you know, it feels better actually not wearing anything. And he oh, was so he's running. completely barefoot running. Yeah, he was on tarmac, concrete, everything that we've been talking about because to me that's the beginner level. And he actually appreciated immediately that, okay, now we're in nature. Nature's undulating, roots hard stones rocks chippings that that would be more compromising for the foot and that's the natural terrain yeah you know so you'd have to go through rewilding processes to go on the hard flat surface learn your craft and then you could take that into nature yeah yeah amazing yeah man Cool. Well, if you come, well, maybe I'll come join you. Yeah, come join me, man. A come join in. Uh, yeah, we get the mics out again. It'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Do a little lapel mics or yeah, something. Yeah, man, we do that. It'd be awesome. Great. Thanks Th- for coming in. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. Bye.